Today's lecture is going to be just a little bit different than usual, and that's because I'm combining chapters 17 and 18. This is happening because chapter 17 covers two types of negative punishment, timeouts and response costs, and chapter 18 covers positive punishment as well as the ethics of different uses of punishment. And the two topics go together very, very well. And if I'm honest, both chapters are fairly short on their own. So what I'm going to do is combine both of them into one normal length lecture, and then we're going to have sort of one extra day free floating, because um, I had I originally intended to have chapter 18 have its own day next week, um, but now I don't need that. So uh, we're just going to combine these two today and then we'll continue on. Uh, the rest of the lecture should all be one at a time, but these two topics just seem to go together so well, so we're doing both for today's lecture. All right, in a previous lecture, when I was talking about operant antecedents, I discussed our discriminative stimulus, our SD, and our extinction stimulus, our S delta, and I mentioned that there was a third type of operant antecedent, which we call the conditioned aversive stimulus. And at the time, I made you aware that it exists, but we didn't talk about what it is or how it works or anything like that. So today is the day where we're actually going to cover that topic. So you should remember an SD is a stimulus or event that precedes an operant and sets the occasion for its reinforcement. It's our occasion setter. It's something that tells you that a behavior is going to be reinforced or that it would be reinforced if that behavior were to occur. Our extinction stimulus, our S delta, is a stimulus or event that precedes an operant and sets the occasion for its non-reinforcement. It tells us that a behavior won't be reinforced if it occurs. And now for the new topic, this is our conditioned aversive stimulus, or S-A-V-E, and that A-V-E is for aversive, because um, I always look at it and think average, but it's aversive. So our S-A-V-E is a stimulus or event that precedes an operant and sets the occasion for escape or avoidance. Basically, this is a condition stimulus that tells you that something bad or something aversive is going to happen, and it gives you the chance to either escape or avoid that situation. Whenever you talk about escape or avoidance conditioning, this would be that uh, stimulus that warns that a shock is coming. Whenever we look at the usual shuttle box arrangement with uh, foot shocks for conditioned escape or avoidance. So our S-A-V-E in that situation would be the red light or the tone or whatever it is that sounds right before the floor is electrified. So it is a signal that lets the animal know that they can do some behavior to escape or avoid an upcoming aversive stimulus. Now, in some literature, you might also see this written as conditional instead of conditioned. Both are used interchangeably. Um, as an aside, what actually happened was when these terms were originally translated, they were just translated incorrectly. Um, and so they were mistranslated as conditioned or unconditioned stimuli. And the correct translation should have been a conditional or unconditional stimulus. Um, but the convention of the original translation stuck around. Um, but every once in a while in my notes, you'll see conditional or conditioned kind of interchangeably. And that's because they're both the same thing, they just sort of have different roots. Um, so if you might have been noticing that throughout the course, I've tried to catch it as often as I can, but uh, yeah, I do sometimes switch. And now you have some useless history as to why. Um, but that's the reasoning behind it is just a uh, translation error. Um, but so we can have our conditioned or conditional aversive stimulus. Um, the thing that we've learned that precedes an aversive situation. We can also have an unconditioned or unconditional aversive stimulus. And if you remember back to our classical conditioning, if we have it as uh, conditioned or unconditioned, it's whether it's something that is learned 
or something that doesn't have to be learned. So an unconditioned aversive stimulus is a stimulus or event that as a function of that species history, um, an organism will escape or avoid naturally. So uh, that could be something like pain. So in our example of escape and avoidance conditioning, where we have a rat in a shuttle box, the floor becoming electrified, that shock feeling, would be an unconditioned aversive stimulus. You don't have to teach a rat that they want to get away from a foot shock. They just do it naturally. But if we get them to learn that a red cue light comes on before the floor is electrified, that red cue light can become a conditioned aversive stimulus. It lets the rat know that the floor will become electrified. Um, so it's something that they have learned is associated with that aversive situation. And an unconditioned or unconditional aversive stimulus can also be called a primary aversive stimulus, and that's because it doesn't have to be learned. Similarly, you could call a conditioned aversive stimulus a secondary aversive stimulus, but I'll try not to uh, interuse words too, too often. Um, if you haven't picked up on it already, in a lot of this literature, people tend to use lots and lots of different words for the exact same concept. So just making you aware of what's out there. And so this next slide just shows different versions of the words, um, but with the same definition so that you know that they're equivalent um, and that they can be used interchangeably. When I'm putting together the tests, I tend to stick to conditioned uh, or unconditioned because that's what I most often use. Um, but yeah, I will uh, try and keep it consistent for you guys, but the literature won't be. Okay, so that terminology out of the way, we're going to do a quick, quick refresher about some aversive contingencies and something that is often confused with aversive contingencies. Um, and these are our two types of punishment. We're also going to talk about negative reinforcement because that one can be confusing to people. But this should all be review from earlier in the course. And when we talked about it earlier in the course, it should have been review from intro psych. So Hopefully by this point, these uh, concepts are something that come pretty naturally to you. But if not, we're going to go over them one more time just so that you are sure that you understand them. And I'm going to be flipping between this slide and the next slide because this one has a visual and this one is the words that go with that visual. So we're going to talk about them both together. Actually, let's start with our visual because that's a nice uh, easy way to begin. So we're looking at two different things. We're looking at what, what the stimulus does following the behavior. Is it presented or is it removed? Are we adding something? Are we adding a stimulus or are we removing a stimulus? If we are adding a stimulus, it's going to be positive whatever. If we're removing a stimulus, it's going to be negative whatever it is. Then we want to look at the effect on the behavior that we're looking at. If we are increasing that behavior, then it's something reinforcement. If we are decreasing the behavior, then we're looking at something punishment. And as we said the first time we went through these four options, um, we can talk about decreasing the behavior, which is sort of short form for reducing the likelihood of that behavior occurring in the future. Um, so instead of saying all of that every single time, um, we can talk about uh, just a shorthand that we're uh, decreasing the behavior. But if we combine our adding or removing a stimulus and whether it increases or decreases a behavior, we get four possibilities. So the one that isn't here is positive reinforcement. And that's because positive reinforcement is something that people tend to understand fairly well. Um, and so it doesn't get confused with our aversive contingencies. It doesn't get confused with our punishment side of things. Um, when we're looking at punishment, we can have positive punishment when you add, to come over here, what, uh, 
a stimulus or event that when presented as a consequence of a behavior decreases the future probability of that behavior occurring. So positive punishment is that you add an aversive stimulus that decreases the future probability of that behavior. Now, we're going to kind of relax our considerations here where we've always focused on the aversive qualities of of something. Um, but when we're looking at these situations in the next little bit, the way that these are going to be framed, it doesn't have to be something that is aversive in the traditional sense that we think of it. Um, it doesn't have to be you are applying a shock or you are yelling at a child or you are like introducing a bad stimulus, something that causes pain or discomfort. Um, because of things like the premac principle, which we'll talk about in a couple of slides, um, any stimulus can be made or most any stimulus can be made to serve as a punisher if it's set in the right situation. And we'll have an example of this in a little bit, but if you frame the situation in the right way, if you control for other aspects of a scenario, um, something as innocuous as, say, drinking water could serve as a punisher because it's ending up reducing the probability of some other behavior occurring in the future. So don't get too, too hung up on the idea of a uh, Punisher, or a, here specifically a positive punisher, being something that's um, only tied to causing pain or discomfort. Um, it doesn't have to always be that way. Just probably me getting ahead of myself, but figured I'd point that out while we're here for the first time and we'll circle back to it a little bit later. All right, so that's the po positive punishment. We are adding something that causes a decrease in the behavior. Negative punishment is removing something to decrease that behavior. So usually you are going to be removing something good, removing something reinforcing to end up increasing, or sorry, to end up decreasing that behavior. So if we go with our rote definition here, this is any event or stimulus that, when removed as a consequence of a behavior, decreases the future probability of that behavior. So if, uh, if a child is playing with their toys and they're yelling and you don't want them to yell, if you take away their toy to make them stop yelling, you are using negative punishment. So you are removing something that they were enjoying to try and decrease the probability of that yelling behavior occurring in the future. And then the third thing that we want to talk about here is negative reinforcement. And we're talking about this not because it is itself an aversive contingency, but because the inclusion of the word negative tends to confuse people and tends to make people think that it has something to do with aversive contingencies. But from the way that we've set things up, um, a negative reinforcer would be the removal of something to increase a behavior. So our definition here is any, stim or any event or stimulus that, when removed as a consequence of a behavior, increases or maintains the future probability of that behavior. So negative reinforcement is usually that you take away something bad um, to increase the probability of the behavior occurring again in the future. So here, the negative doesn't mean anything to do with punishment. The negative just means that we're taking something away. But our net outcome here, the result, is reinforcement, is an increase in the probability of that behavior occurring in the future. So we're including negative reinforcement here as a reminder not to confuse it with the two forms of punishment. So it would be a good idea to know uh, this diagram or at least understand the difference between the positive and negative reinforcement and punishment because it is still and will pretty much for the rest of the course continue to be important. All right. So now we're going to talk about 
the parts of these two chapters where we go over things like positive punishment and negative punishment. So we're focusing on those aversive contingencies and we're going to focus on some of the specific types of punishment that are commonly seen in different scenarios. Now we're going to talk about the ethical considerations that should go along with any kind of punishment towards the end of the chapter, um, but I want to make you aware that we will be talking about ethics because whenever punishment is used, there are always going to be ethical considerations. So a quick little disclaimer here to say that any form of punishment that's used in behavior modification should only be used as a last resort. Basically, if you can use any of the other techniques that we've talked about so far, if you can use extinction, if you can use differential reinforcement, any of those other techniques, if those could be used instead, they should absolutely be used instead. But sometimes it isn't viable or isn't feasible to use those, and sometimes punishment becomes the best option. So... We will talk more about the ethics and the specific considerations, but just a quick um, quick thing to keep in the back of your mind as we walk through each of these types of positive and negative punishment, just because they can seem very extreme. So keep in mind that they're only ever used as a last resort. So the first of these that we're going to talk about is uh, for positive punishment is overcorrection. So this is a form of positive punishment in which the individual has to engage in some kind of effortful behavior contingent on the problem behavior. And so this wording, when we're saying contingent on the problem behavior, it means that if they do the problem behavior, then they're going to be made to engage in some kind of effortful behavior. So if a child throws a temper tantrum, then they're going to be made to do some activity, some effortful behavior that they don't necessarily want to do, hence positive punishment. And we can talk about, uh, I believe, three different uh, subcategories of overcorrection. Nope, just two. I paused for just a second to double check. Uh, should have trusted myself that there are two on the slide and there's two forms of overcorrection. Oh, all right. So our two types of overcorrection are positive practice and restitution. So for positive practice, this is a form of overcorrection where contingent on the problem behavior, the individual has to engage in corrective forms of relevant behavior for a period of time. So again, we have that weird contingent on the problem behavior. So if the subject does the problem behavior, then they're going to be made to engage in the correct form of that behavior for a certain set period of time. The textbook uses an example of a child who wets the bed. And the positive practice is that when they wet the bed, they then have to practice getting up out of bed and walking to the bathroom because that's the correct behavior. Wetting the bed is the problem behavior, and the correct behavior, or the relevant behavior, would be to get out of bed and go to the bathroom instead. So, as positive practice, the parent has the child practice getting out of bed and walking to the bathroom ten times. So, in that process, there's effort in having to get out of bed and walk to the bathroom, and that extra effort of having to go through those extra steps actually makes the child less likely to wet the bed in the future. So the effort involved in going through the positive practice helps reduce the occurrence of the problem behavior in the future. So positive punishment, the addition or, uh, or the delivery of this effortful behavior makes the problem behavior less likely to occur in the future. And kind of related to that, we can have restitution, where, again, contingent on the problem behavior, the individual is now required to fix the environment disrupted by the problem behavior. So if the subject does the problem behavior, their effortful behavior is them actually fixing the environment that they disrupted with their problem behavior. 
and the textbook uses two examples. One is a child who colors on the walls, and the restitution effortful behavior is to actually clean the walls. So when the child draws on the walls, they're made to clean up their mess. So that behavior isn't directly related to um, a relevant behavior that's kind of the opposite of our problem behavior. It's actually just correcting any environmental disruptions that were caused by the problem behavior. Another example would be a child throwing a temper tantrum at school if they flip over their desk. They would then be made to put their desk back in line and maybe line up the desks in the area. So you can expand on that restitution act to make the behavior more effortful. So instead of the child just cleaning up where they colored on the walls, maybe get them to clean the rest of the wall. Um, if the child flipped over their desk, maybe put their own desk back and make sure that the other desks in the area are straight. Um, depending on the situation, you can adjust the degree of effort involved in that corrective behavior. But to tell the difference between our positive practice and restitution, for positive practice, it's them performing that effortful behavior of doing what the problem behavior did wrong, correct. So instead of wetting the bed, you go to the bathroom. For the restitution side of things, you are fixing any problems to the environment caused by that problem behavior. So if the child disrupts their environment, their effortful behavior is to correct that behavior and bring the or restore the environment back to the condition that it was in before the problem behavior, or even better than the condition it was in before the problem behavior. Another similar form of positive punishment would be contingent exercise. So contingent on the problem behavior, the individual engages in some effortful behavior for a specified period of time. And here, um, so the the problem behavior occurs, and then the individual has to engage in some sort of effortful behavior. Unlike the other two examples, this effortful behavior is completely unrelated to the problem behavior. So positive practice, it had to be sort of the correct version of the problem behavior. For restitution, it has to correct disruptions caused by the problem behavior. In contingent exercise, it doesn't matter what the effortful behavior is. It's going to be something unrelated to the problem behavior. It could be something like performing physical exercise. So if a child acts out, they have to do jumping jacks. Um, maybe if you've ever been on a sports team, if someone speaks out of turn, the coach might make them run laps. That would be contingent exercise where if you do something bad, then you have to go and do this effortful behavior of running around the field. Another form of positive punishment that's a little bit more complicated is guided compliance. This is going to be a form of positive punishment in which, again, contingent upon the problem behavior that occurs, but this time specifically problem behavior that occurs following a request the individual is physically guided to comply with the request. So if a parent asks their child to put away their laundry and the child doesn't comply with that request, so the problem behavior here is not putting away their laundry when asked. So our guided compliance would then be that the parents physically guide the child through putting away their laundry. And this one is a little bit more complicated, like I said, because it's not just positive punishment. There are other things here as well. So we have positive punishment of non-compliance. So if they don't follow the request, then they are physically guided through compliance. So if they don't do the request, if they don't put away their laundry, then the parent is going to hold their hand and put the laundry away with them. So in this situation, saying no means that you are made to comply and that you are physically guided through that compliance. So that's the positive uh, punishment there. But there's also some negative reinforcement of compliance, because if the child starts putting the laundry away by themselves, if they don't want the parent to be physically helping them put it away, if they start doing it themselves, then the parents will step back. 
So that's the removal of that aversive stimulus of the parents physically helping them, and it makes the child more likely to comply in the future. Um, they don't want to be physically guided through it, so they will just do it themselves. And with these two steps, you can also very easily introduce positive reinforcement of compliance. If the child starts doing it by themselves, then you reinforce that behavior with praise. Um, so you can incorporate multiple uh, versions of reinforcement um, and you can punish the bad behavior. So get them away from not complying and get them to do more of the complying. Another more controversial type of positive punishment is physical restraint. And this is a form of positive punishment in which, contingent on our problem behavior, the body part involved in the behavior is held immobile for a specified period of time. Um, so this could be something like, uh, maybe there's a child who, when they act out, maybe they slap a sibling or maybe they're like, ver uh, they have violent responses to some kind of situation and their, uh, reaction is to flail about, potentially causing damage to other people or to themselves. So physical restraint in this case would be to hold their hand, stop them from slapping other people, stop them from hurting themselves with their hands. And this can be used in conjunction with response blocking, which is when you physically stop a behavior from being completed. So um, if the child were engaging in self-injurious behaviors, maybe they were um, hitting their open hand against their face, then the change agent, the person who is going through the positive punishment setup, would physically block their hand from hitting their face. They can um, block that response of causing themselves harm. Either physical restraint or response blocking can help prevent problems that are generated by that behavior. It can prevent causing harm to others. Um, it might also even prevent the behavior from being reinforced. So if, uh, if the child is engaging in self-injuring behavior, it might be because the sensation is reinforcing. So by physically blocking that response by going through response blocking and preventing that in self-injurious behavior, then there is no reinforcement from that behavior occurring because the sensation isn't happening. So you can stop other problems being caused and you can reduce the reinforcing aspect of that behavior to make it less likely to occur in the future. All right, so that is it for our positive punishments. Now we're going to talk about negative punishment. So this is the removal of a uh, pleasant stimulus, removal of something good to try and reduce the occurrence of a behavior in the future. Or more simply put, this is the loss of access to positive reinforcers for a period of time. And we're going to talk about two of the most common negative punishment forms, and this is timeouts and response costs. So uh, timeout is, again, a shortened form of the full term being time out from positive reinforcement. So specifically, you need to have a situation where you are removing them from a situation that is positively reinforcing. So a timeout is a form of negative punishment in which loss of access to positive reinforcement is contingent on a particular response. So if a child misbehaves in class, then maybe they're removed from a reinforcing situation like arts and crafts. So they can be removed from that positive reinforcing situation and given a timeout by having to sit somewhere else. The most important part here is that the timeout needs to prevent access to whatever reinforcer is maintaining the problem behavior. So if their reinforcer is attention, then you would give them a timeout from getting attention. You'd put them somewhere where they're no longer receiving attention. If their positive reinforcer is getting to play a video game, 
then maybe you put them in a different room where they no longer have access to that video game. Or maybe you take away the controller so that they can no longer play. And this actually leads us to two terms here at the bottom where we can have exclusionary and non-exclusionary timeouts. So non-exclusionary timeouts would be that the person is removed from activities or interactions, but is allowed to remain in the same room. So maybe you unplug the video game that's causing, that's reinforcing that negative behavior, and they are given a time out from playing that game, but they can stay in the same room because they cannot play that game. There is no access to that reinforcer. In an exclusionary timeout, the person is removed from the room where that reinforcement was happening. So the room is considered the reinforcing environment and they'd be brought to a different room where they are removed from that reinforcing situation. Whether you use exclusionary or non-exclusionary timeouts usually just depends on the situation that you're in. If, uh, say you're at a child's birthday party and everyone's in the dining room, you can't really give a child a timeout from the attention of the other children and have them in the same room as everyone. They would have to go to a different room. So non-exclusionary timeout wouldn't apply in that scenario because just being around the other kids in the same room is reinforcing. So you would have to go with exclusionary timeout in that situation and move them to a different location. Um, for some other things that we need to consider, the timeout should be administered immediately. As soon as that negative behavior or as soon as that problem behavior occurs, they should be brought to that alternative location um, or brought to a different part of the room if they're staying in the room. Um, to get them to go to their timeout, you might have to use physical guidance. So you take a child by the hand and walk them to another room. Um, over time, the physical guidance should no longer be necessary, but at the beginning it might be necessary. Um, you should also make sure that there are no means of escaping the timeout. If you put a child in another room, make sure that they can't just open the door and walk back out again. Um, you also want to make sure that there are no other reinforcers accessible in that place that they are put for the timeout. So if you are giving the child uh, a timeout from attention, um, say they're um, getting attention in the living room with other children, don't send them to a room where they might get attention from their dog. Or if they're playing games in the family room and you send them for a timeout in their bedroom, make sure that they don't have another gaming system in that room. Um, so wherever they are going through their timeout, other reinforcers should not be accessible and they should not be able to physically leave the place that they are being timed out. Um, so usually this would be accomplished by having the person who's enforcing the timeout be nearby to make sure that they're not leaving the room. Um, if at all possible, watch them, um, but it's always best to make sure that they can't see you because you watching them might also be reinforcing. Um, so lots of things to consider in those cases. Um, after our timeout, we can talk about response cost. And this is a type of negative punishment where, contingent on a problem behavior occurring, a specified amount of reinforcer is removed. So this time, instead of removing the subject from the reinforcer, we are now going to be removing the reinforcer from the subject. It is usually better to have this loss occur immediately, but it isn't always practical for this loss to occur immediately. So if the reinforcer loss has to be delayed, then, then we should have some kind of conditioned punisher used to bridge the gap between um, when they have done the behavior that's causing that loss and when the loss actually happens. You want to provide some kind of immediate consequence so that they know that they've done something wrong. So a conditioned punisher would be something like getting a speeding ticket. If you get a speeding ticket, our behavior, our problem behavior is driving too fast, our conditioned punisher is getting a speeding ticket. That ticket itself doesn't mean anything except that it tells you that you now have to pay a fine. 
And the loss of our reinforcer is going to be the amount of money that you lose because of that behavior, because of your speeding. The textbook uses an example where a child loses some of their allowance every week whenever they engage in problem behaviors, such as fighting with their sibling. So every time they fight with their sibling, they receive a verbal statement that they are going to lose a certain amount off of their allowance. And then later on, that amount is deducted from their allowance. So the condition punisher is brought up immediately to bridge that gap um, until the consequence can happen. When deciding on which reinforcer should be deducted, um, you have to consider which reinforcers are actually maintaining that behavior or which reinforcers you can have control over that might have an effect on that problem behavior. So money is a really common one. Um, you could set up the use of tokens, which are equivalent to money in a lot of situations because they are conditioned um, tokens where lose, uh, you can use them to get things just like money does. So losing a token could also be seen the same way as losing money. But different situations can work with different kinds of reinforcers. Um, just money and tokens tend to be the most common ones because they've been used most widely. We also have to consider the magnitude of the removal. So how much of a deduction is going to be sufficient to drop the likelihood of that problem behavior occurring in the future? So how large of a fine should it be? If a speeding ticket was only $5, then people probably wouldn't stop speeding. Paying $5 to go really fast might be fine for some people. So they might have to adjust the magnitude to make sure that it is actually acting as a negative punisher. Otherwise, it's not doing its job and it isn't actually a punishment. All right, we are now finally going to circle back to what I had kind of rambled on a little bit about earlier, where when we talk about positive punishment, we aren't always talking about an aversive stimulus, something that is painful or uncomfortable, causing a decrease in a behavior. That is one type of positive punishment. But most of what we've talked about so far for positive punishment have actually been aversive activities. So having to do something effortful if you do the bad behavior. So even though most of the definitions that you'll hear for positive punishment, those usually refer to some kind of stimulation or an aversive stimulus being introduced, we tend to actually prefer aversive activities instead. When trying to modify behavior, actual aversive or punishing uh, stimulation is very rarely used. And as time goes on, we get uh, further and further away from that being an acceptable option. As we learn about other alternatives, as we learn about better alternatives, um, all of the other techniques that we've talked about before this, it becomes less and less appropriate to pretty much ever use aversive stimulation. There are some cases where it can be used, um, and the textbook talks about two specific examples. There's an example of uh, treating rumination and bruxism. Um, and these are sort of weird outliers. But some quick examples of aversive stimulation would be uh, applying a bad tasting thing. Uh, in this case, they use lemon juice. And the example, very, very briefly, is that there's a young child who regurgitates their food shortly after eating. And because they're regurgitating, they're going through rumination, they end up not eating enough and it's causing the child to be severely underweight and it's actually putting their life at risk. So this positive punishment is that whenever they ruminate, whenever they bring back up their food, a nurse would spray some lemon juice on their tongue. And that bitter taste is an aversive stimulus in this situation, and it makes them less likely to ruminate. And so this uh, was chosen as 
a practice because nothing else that they were doing could stop the rumination, and if the rumination had continued, it could have caused the child's death. So in an extreme situation, aversive stimulation was deemed necessary. Um, you could have, uh, the other example they talk about is applying ice. So something that was applied to the side of their cheeks for, I think it was five seconds to stop them from grinding their jaws together. Um, and that was causing damage to their teeth that was causing damage to their jaw. And so the discomfort of having ice applied to the side of their face for a couple of seconds was deemed an appropriate um, method of stopping that behavior because the behavior was dangerous and causing them harm. Um, there are things like uh, really strong bad smells. Um, behavior targeted reprimands where you could scold someone or shout at someone for doing a particular behavior. Um, some kind of auditory stimulation, which would be a really loud noise applied, spanking. These are all types of aversive stimulation. And pretty much all of these are frowned upon in most situations. Um, as I said, there were two very specific ones where if we look at the ethical side of things, you kind of have to have tried absolutely everything else. This has to be your only option. And it's only used in situations where not stopping the problem behavior could cause physical harm. So something to keep in mind. So, all right. We've got the whole, we'll use aversive activities, but not uh, aversive stimuli. All right, what else should we keep in mind? Um, and we can actually bring back our PREMAC principle. Um, and we've already talked about the PREMAC principle for reinforcement. This was mentioned very, very briefly a couple of uh, lectures back, but we're going to go into it in more detail today. And then we're going to talk about how we can apply this principle to punishment. So as a reminder, our PREMAC principle when we were talking about reinforcement told us that a high probability behavior reinforces low probability behavior. So if you have to do a low probability behavior in order to be able to then do a high probability behavior, then that's going to increase the amount of low probability behavior that you engage in. So if we wanted to think about what are high and low probability behaviors, a low probability behavior is something that you don't often engage in. It is something that an individual has a low probability of doing if left to their own devices. So a child might have a low probability of doing their homework, but they have a high probability of playing video games. So if we set up a scenario in which they have to do their homework in order to play video games, then we will see an increase in this low probability behavior because it gets followed by a higher probability behavior. So this high probability behavior is reinforcing the occurrence of our low probability behavior. We should note that the opposite of this is not true. So low probability behavior does not reinforce high probability behavior. So if you have to do the high probability behavior to then do a low probability behavior, then th this high probability behavior doesn't really change. If you have to play video games before you can do your homework, you're not going to play any more or less video games than you would have before. Um, we aren't really changing the scenario here because doing homework isn't something that you want to do anything to be able to do. So uh, high can reinforce low, but low cannot reinforce high. So let's look at an example where we actually get to see this in action. And once again, I have both a visual and a text version of what we're going to talk about. So the text version, I'm going to just sort of show you very, very briefly, but I'm actually going to do my talking over on the visual version where I can actually show you the graphs that go along with what we're talking about. But I did want to make sure that if you are somebody who does a lot better with the words and the verbal side of things, that you actually have it all written out. Um, I just find it a little bit easier to talk with the visuals. So hopefully you don't mind too, too much. <laughs> 
but we're going to be talking about rats and uh, drinking and running on a wheel. And so for part one here, we're going to have fluid deprived rats. Basically, rats weren't given access to water for 34 hours. Um, basically, they waited a day and then they ran this study at the last part of the day um, during that 24 or 23 to 24 hour mark of the day. So this meant that the rats were water deprived. So we're setting up our own uh, establishing operation where water is something that might be more motivating. So let's take a look at what their different behaviors look like at the beginning here. So if we have our water deprived rats, we find that as a baseline, when given the option of do they want to drink water or do they want to run on their wheel, we find that the rats want to spend a lot of time drinking. Kind of makes sense. We set up a situation in which they're thirsty. So in this case, our high probability behavior is drinking water because they do want to drink a lot of water. Our low probability behavior is running because in comparison, the rats are doing a lot less running than they are drinking. So let's set up a situation where they have to do a low probability behavior in order to do a high probability behavior. So let's say that the rats have to run on the treadmill in order to drink water. From what we've talked about with this premac principle, I'm sure you can predict what might happen. Uh, oh, there we go. And what we see is that if we set up this scenario, we see that they will run more. So drinking serves as a reinforcer for running. Our high probability behavior serves as a reinforcer for our low probability behavior. And in this experiment, they actually ran it the other way as well. Oop. Messing up my pen here. All right. So let's say we have to drink water in order to run. Um, and from what we talked about on the previous slide, if we have a high probability behavior followed by a low probability behavior, that low probability behavior isn't overly reinforcing. And we see that they will not drink to run. So they will run to drink if uh, running is low probability and drinking is high probability. And in that uh, running is low and drinking is high, they will not drink to run. Okay, so let's clear off my little scribbles here. And let's see what happens if we actually change up the environment a little bit here. Now we have rats that are given free access to drinking water. So water is no longer restricted. So we've removed that establishing operation. So let's see what happens for our new baseline. When these rats who are not water deprived are given the option of drinking or running on the wheel, we see that they do the opposite. They would rather run than drink because they've had access to water, they're not thirsty. So now running is our high probability behavior and drinking in, is our low probability behavior. So if we have the same option up here where we ask, will they run to drink up here? It was a low to high. But if we ask on the bottom here, will they run to be able to drink? It's actually a high to low. So it's the exact same behaviors, but from our premac principle, we're framing them differently because the probabilities of the behavior has changed with these two different environments, whether they are water deprived or not. So if we set it up this way, we're now doing, uh, will this low probability behavior reinforce our high probability behavior? And the answer is no. Drinking doesn't reinforce running when drinking is a low probability behavior. But if we then ask, will they drink to run, which is going to be a, oh, make sure I get it the right way around, a, a low probability behavior of drinking to be able to run a low to high, now we see an increase. 
And if you remember up here, this uh, situation, it was high to low uh, the first time. So low to high will reinforce, high to low will not reinforce. And this is such an elegant experiment because they showed that changing the conditions in the environment by just changing the access to water, we can see this change in the probabilities of these behaviors occurring. So it isn't that running is always reinforcing or drinking is always reinforcing. Which of these activities can be reinforcing depends entirely on the probability of those behaviors occurring. And that's what the PREMAC principle is all about. Now, I promised that we would go from talking about PREMAC in terms of reinforcement to talking about how it applies to punishment. And so here we're saying that uh, when punishment is concerned, low probability behavior punishes high probability behavior. behavior. So we're saying that if you engage in this high probability behavior, then you're going to have to do this low probability behavior. This low probability behavior can punish or reduce the occurrence of this high probability behavior. In terms of our discussion of aversive contingencies, a high probability behavior would be a problem behavior. So maybe this is throwing a temper tantrum. And then maybe our low probability behavior is something that the child does less often than throwing a temper tantrum. Could be something like cleaning their room or going for a walk or sitting quietly. Um, it doesn't have to be itself an aversive stimulus to punish this high probability behavior, as long as it's something that occurs less than that high probability um, problem behavior. So let's look at another example, and we're going to, because we're so well established with rats, talk about a punishment example with rats. So rats in a fluid deprivation state, so we have that they were given reduced water. And from that graph, we had seen that drinking is a high probability thing and running is a low probability thing when they are uh, deprived of water. And we can set it up so that if they drink, which is their high probability behavior, then they have to run. So we force that drinking is followed by running. High probability behavior is followed by a low probability behavior. And as a result, we actually see that the amount of water drank will drop off. So a decrease in drinking behavior. So running, that low probability behavior, functions as a punisher for drinking. And this could be something like a contingent exercise. So uh, clear these guys off. But if your high probability behavior is a temper tantrum or a child screaming or whatever, you can have that low probability behavior is uh, doing push-ups or sit-ups or some kind of exercise. So if they throw a temper tantrum, then they have to do exercise. So you will see less temper tantrums thrown because that low probability behavior of doing exercise serves as a punisher for the higher probability behavior, which is pretty cool when we think about it that way. All right, so I've already rambled on quite a bit about uh, escape and avoidance learning earlier on, but um, I do have slides for it specifically here so we can go into it in more detail. Again, this is something that I believe we've talked about previously and that you would have learned in Psych 104 as well, but we're going to go over it just one more time because it does apply here because we can relate it to some of the concepts we've talked about earlier. So we're going to frame escape learning as a situation where an operant changes the environment from a situation where a negative reinforcer is present to one where it is absent. So here, our behavior, our operant, is running from one side of the cage to the other. So in a standard shuttle box, you have a side where the bars on the bottom are electrified. There's a mild electric current running through and it applies an aversive stimulus. On the other side, it's safe. There is no electric current there. 
So the operant behavior of moving from one side to the other allows you to escape from this aversive stimulus. So moving from the electrified side over to the safe side, that behavior allows you to avoid this aversive stimulus. And this behavior is negatively reinforced because going from this side to that side involves the remove, uh, removement? No, the removal of a negative or aversive stimulus. So escape learning is when you learn to escape an ongoing aversive stimulus. You experience something unpleasant and you do a behavior, you do an operant response to escape from that aversive situation. And that is negatively reinforced. We usually consider escape learning hand in hand with avoidance learning, which we're gonna talk about on the next slide. But we should consider that our escape responses are typically learned faster than avoidance responses because the escape responses, <clears throat> sorry, uh, sorry, our escape responses are typically simpler or they only involve one step, whereas avoidance responses tend to be a little bit more complex and have multiple steps involved, which we'll see on the next slide. The uh, rate at which these escape responses are learned or conditioned can be contingent upon um, the compatibility with reflexive unconditioned responses, which basically means the more similar the operant behavior is to what the animal would do when they were naturally in that situation, the faster they're going to learn it. So if escape learning involved something strange like pressing a lever or pushing a button or climbing a set of stairs. It might take a little bit longer for the animal to learn that. But if escape learning is as simple as the example I talked about where they just run to the other side, then it's going to be learned a lot faster because running from an aversive stimulus is pretty consistent with the reflexive, unconditioned response to that stimulus out in the wild. So. Conditioning escape is going to be easiest when our operant behavior is most similar to the reflexive or unconditioned response behavior that's elicited by that aversive stimulus. So the closer it is to what they would do naturally, the faster they're going to learn it. As I had mentioned, avoidance learning is usually talked about in the same breath and takes just a little bit longer to learn because it's a little bit more complicated. In this situation, an operant behavior ends up preventing the occurrence of an aversive stimulus. So instead of just escaping a stimulus that has happened, we can now prevent that stimulus from occurring. And so this, as I said, involves an extra step, which brings us back to our SAVE that we talked about at the very beginning of today's lecture. And so this says that we're going to learn discriminated avoidance. So we have a stimulus, our SAVE, that lets us know that an aversive stimulus is coming. So if we have this situation of discriminated avoidance, it's a situation where the presence of this SAVE controls the probability of making an avoidance response. So if there's a stimulus like a cue light or a warning tone that tells us that the floor in the shuttle box is going to be electrified, then the animal can learn that that signal means that the floor will become electrified and I should do a behavior to avoid that electrified floor. So if the rat learns what this signal means, they'll move to the safe side of the cage before they have a chance to ever experience that aversive stimulus. As a rule of thumb, it tends to take longer to establish an SAV than it is to establish an SD or an S delta, just because of the nature of the situation. And because of its association with that aversive stimulus, our SAV often becomes a conditioned stimulus itself, where 
the animal can respond to that conditioned stimulus instead of the nice, clean, operant behavior that we might be hoping for. So our avoidance learning ends up just a little bit tied in with uh, classical conditioning as well as operant conditioning. So it's, as I said, more complicated than escape learning. And that's why it tends to take a lot longer to learn as well. And if you've talked about um, escape learning and avoidance learning, you have almost uh, definitely also heard about the idea of learned helplessness. And that's because this concept tends to tie in with escape and avoidance learning very well. Um, so this was a study done in the 60s where they have a shuttle box here, the same as what we saw with rats, but they were working with dogs. So the same setup with mildly electrified bars that would cause discomfort, and on the other side the bars are non-electrified. And so when dogs are put through the same avoidance learning training that rats go through, they can learn to move from one side of the box to the other when a cue lets them know that the floor is going to become electrified. So they can learn to avoid an aversive stimulus no problem. However, when we talk about learned helplessness, um, there's a, a different group that instead of going through the normal um, avoidance learning procedure, they would be prevented from moving from one side to the other. So there would still be a cue, our SAVE, letting us know that the aversive stimulus is coming, but instead of being able to freely move to the other side of the cage, this would be blocked off. So they would know that the aversive stimulus is coming, but they would be unable to escape or avoid it. And so they would learn that the shock is going to happen no matter what I do, so they don't try and do anything. And the worst part is that when this is opened back up again and they have the opportunity to move to the other side, because they learned that there was no way to avoid that shock previously, they make no attempt to avoid the shock now. And this idea of learned helplessness has been shown in many, many species and is pretty commonly used as a model for depression and anxiety, where we learn that no matter what we do, we're going to feel awful, everything is terrible, and eventually we stop trying to avoid or escape bad situations. So having this model can try and help us uh, understand what's going on. And it leads to some ideas for treatment and prevention. So for treatment, if you can set up a situation in which failure of avoidance is not possible, so maybe they are physically moved to the other side of the cage, um, where they cannot continue to experience the shock, they are put in a place where there is no aversive stimulus that could help treat the development of learned helplessness for someone who had already learned it. We can also have prevention, where if uh, these animals are pre-exposed to escape and avoidance contingencies before being put in that learned helplessness scenario where there's no escape, then it actually blocks learning learned helplessness. So if there's some pre-exposure pre -exposure that's showing them that their actions can have consequences, then they won't uh, end up having that learned helplessness uh, sink in. So if it does happen, you can treat it. It's probably a lot better off to prevent it if at all possible. Um, but this is a very simplified version of what has come to be a really great model for depression and anxiety. So just quickly mentioning it here. And towards the very, very end here, I'm going to sort of summarize some of the considerations that I slipped in a little bit earlier when we started talking about punishment, and then we'll talk about some ethical considerations as well. This is one of those scenarios where the textbook talks about these quite a bit more at length, but we're going to hit some cold notes here. Um, actually, the textbook does a great job because it directs you into sort of if there are questions that you have. It points to some advanced readings and stuff that if you're curious, you could look into. Um, but considerations and ethics for punishment are constantly evolving. So it's a pretty interesting field if it's something you're curious in or curious about. 
Um, but yeah, let's talk about our considerations. And as I mentioned, punishment is pretty much only used as a last resort. And there are people who advocate for punishment never being a viable option. So there are people with differing opinions, and some people will choose to never use punishment no matter what. There are others who would argue that punishment can be effective under certain conditions. So the rules that people can sort of agree on, or at least things that we should keep in mind, are that we should try and use some kind of functional intervention first. Basically, by the time that we're using punishment, we should have tried all of the other possible um, procedures that we've talked about throughout the course. We should try differential reinforcement. We should try extinction. We should try um, positive reinforcement of other behaviors and all of those other things. Um, so we should have other things considered or at least if you can't uh, physically try them and have them fail, then maybe there's other research that's shown that it doesn't work in this situation. Or maybe it isn't physically possible in a certain setup. Or maybe it doesn't work fast enough and there's a life at stake or something like that. Um, so again, it should be a last resort. But you should also be implementing differential reinforcement along with punishment. So the same as when we were talking about having extinction and positive reinforcement previously, you would also want to use punishment along with some kind of other reinforcement. Whether you're reinforcing another specific behavior, if you're reinforcing a good behavior and punishing a bad behavior, or maybe you're just punishing a bad behavior and reinforcing anything but that bad behavior. We do have to consider the function of the problem behavior. What are they getting out of this problem behavior? Is it attention? Is it stimulation? The nature of that behavior, what they're getting out of it, can dramatically affect which forms of punishment are effective. So for example, if a problem behavior is reinforcing because it's stimulating, if the act of yelling makes them happy because they like the sound, then giving them time out isn't going to help that because they might go to another room and continue yelling, which continues to be reinforcing. We also have to choose the aversive stimulus that's being used with care. Is it some kind of activity? Is it a specific stimulus? Um, and is it ethical to be using that? Which we'll come back to ethics in just a minute. But um, as with all of our different types of behavior modification procedures, you absolutely want to make sure that you're collecting data to make your treatment decisions. You want a, a baseline, a before uh, shot of what their behavior looks like to make sure that this procedure is actually having an effect on their behavior. You want to make sure that if you have to rely on punishment, that it's at least effective in what you're trying to do. And then we bring along the ethics. If you're going to use punishment, you have to address all of the ethical considerations that are involved. So the first of these, a big one, is informed consent. So um, they need uh, people entering into a behavior modification program that involves punishment. They need to know what is going to be involved. And because a lot of what we talk about is changing behavior for, say, children or people with uh, mental disabilities or anything like that, not everyone is going to be able to give informed consent themselves. So you might have to get uh, parents or guardians involved. Someone has to be informed of all of the possible um, benefits and detriments, and they still have to agree to the procedure. As I said, we need to consider our alternatives. Is there something else that would be safer, that would work better, that would work just as efficiently but not be as aversive? We need to consider our participant safety. Is this punishment going to potentially cause harm? Um, how severe is the problem? Is it something that needs punishment or is it something that isn't so bad? Um, we talked about those situations where if 
the problem behavior wasn't corrected, that child could have died from malnutrition. So that problem was so severe that it justified the extremes of using punishment. You also have to consider guidelines for implementation. Um, if you're working within a, uh, an institution or if you're working with a company, they might have rules and regulations that need to be followed. Um, maybe you're conducting research and you have to follow the guidelines of that institution. You need to know what rules you have to operate within. And the people doing the punishment, they need to have training and be supervised. You need to make sure that the people implementing this procedure know how it works. They're well trained in it and they're going to do it properly. And you want to make sure that they're not just left to their own devices. You want to make sure that they're doing it right. They are properly supervised. Um, within institutions or any time that data is being collected and published, there should always be peer review. So things shouldn't just be looked at by the people doing the procedure. Their peers should also look at what they're doing and make sure that it's ethical. And there always has to be accountability. So there are rules and regulations and laws in place that govern what can and cannot be done. And if any of these are violated, then there is indeed punishment for it. So hefty fines. Uh, as a researcher, if you break ethical considerations, you are basically never going to be allowed to publish again. So these, um, these rules and laws and regulations hold everyone accountable to prevent misuse and overuse of punishment. So our big take home here is it's only ever used when absolutely necessary. It's highly governed and regulated, and it has to be used in very specific scenarios. Otherwise, uh, there are severe consequences for those using these procedures. Um, so that is a pretty intense topic. And as I said, two whole chapters, but they all fit together so well that hopefully you don't mind them all together. It'll give us a free day later on, but I'll make an announcement on E-Class as to how we'll redistribute our courses, so.